Welcome, brethren, to Section 3 of our presentation on the history of Mount Carmel Center, and we'll be covering the era, a historical summary, from 1929 to 1955. So the message of the Shepherd's Rod began in 1929, and it had its beginning at the Olympic Exposition Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here, the Sabbath school teacher, Victor T. Hadoff, begins to receive and share divine revelation showing that the prophecies found in the latter chapters of the book of Isaiah were directly applicable to Israel of today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. By divine providence, the Sabbath school lesson quarterly just happened to be covering these very chapters in Isaiah. And here's a picture of this Sabbath school quarterly. It's available at the General Conference Archives, and you can also download it from our website, upa7.org. So this was God's plan, was that it was time for light to unveil on these prophecies at the appointed time. So at the appointed hour, God raises up a messenger to bear a message. And that messenger, of course, as we know, is this man, Brother Victor Tasho Haudoff. And his message was embodied in this book called The Shepherd's Rod, the 144,000, A Call for Reformation. And volume one of this book was published on December 4th, 1930. So in the period of from 1930 to 1940, this message rose up in California. And we'll highlight the developments here. Uh, as we mentioned, December 4th, 1930, uh, The Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, was published. In September 6th of 1931, the first tithe was collected. This is an important date because it signifies the time in which the storehouse moved. I want you to think about that. No longer was the tithe to go to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the reason why is because they had be begun open warfare against the rod and were preaching against it. In September of 1932, Shepherd's Rod Volume 2, a 355-page book, was published. August 24, 1933, the track series was begun with track number one, first edition. December 29, 1933, track number two, first edition. May 24, 1934, track number three, first edition. July 15, 1934, the symbolic codes were started. August 28, 1934, track one, or track number four, first edition. And we should note here that there were these tracks were later revised, and so there were second and sometimes, in some cases, third editions of these uh, publications of these tracks. And all of this information here is found in track number 13, second edition, pages 48, uh, 44 to 48, some of the chronology and the history of the development of the Shepherd's Rod message. So where's this movement found in Scripture? Well, there's a scriptural commission to hear the rod, and it's found in these verses. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 and 9. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it. So, of course, the Lord is contending before the mountains and the hills. His, his church, his voice is crying into the city, into the church, to hear the rod, the only rod that has ever spoken. It's also found in Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3, we're told, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who hath no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? 
Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So here we're told, uh, for those that are thirsting for truth and righteousness, to come and receive this water, truth, without price or cost. And this is the bread of life that will satisfy, not the books and publications and uh, that were being written uh, uninspired by men, but by an inspired message that God has sent to his church. We have further inspired instructions how to advance this truth, the message of the shepherd's rod. And we'll read a couple statements there that make it very clear exactly how this message was to be brought and distributed to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We read this passage here from Shepherd's Rod Track, page 11. But how can we know for sure? Another question is that this and companion publications are the genuine fruit of the unrolling of the scroll and of the sealing angel's arrival. Simply, if the claimant herein on trial is vindicated by all relevant scripture and other inspired testimony, and if it is, then the only admissible conclusion is that the divinely appointed and long-awaited hour has struck. And that this literature is the instrument used by insp inspiration to make the event known to God's people. So we see here the role of published literature is a, really the foundation, the instrument by which God seeks to make known the message of the hour, the judgment of the living, found in the shepherd's rod. This is also indicated here in this statement in Timely Greetings, Volume 1, number 27, page 11, it reads, Surely, Micah 6 leaves no doubt whatsoever that the time is fully come for God's people to get down to business as never before. The message which we have been entrusted, inspiration commands, should be scattered as the leaves of autumn. Testimonies, volume 9, page 231. And here are the leaves. Of course, the leaves were the track literature that was designed in a specific way and purpose to fit in the pocket and to be published in large quantities, and distributed literally as the leaves of autumn everywhere throughout the denomination. So here's our instructions. The literature was furthermore to go without cost as the leaves of autumn. And this is plain from these statements in Timely Greetings, uh, Volume 1, Number 17, Page 5. It reads, then, too, spiritual latter rain must fall as freely and without cost to the recipients as does literal rain. Thus, it is that never before has the world witnessed so much absolutely free literature scattered away as this literature is. Millions. So it is that these small, comprehensive publications, the bright clouds laden with present truth, are now being scattered as leaves of autumn throughout Laodicea to every church member, to every one grass in the vineyard of the Lord. The final results? More than 1,000 attest inspiration will soon be converted in one day, most of whom will trace their first convictions to the reading of our publications. Review and Herald, November 10, 1885. So here it's very clear that the literature is to be free, it's not to be compiled or, or sold, and we're going to see this in a later presentation about how the rod message has been altered and remodeled. It's very clear here that it's to go out as a comprehensive, small pocket size, scattered as the leaves of autumn. In this passage here, in General Conference Special, page 35, it reads, Further, concerning this timely truth, this meet and due season, Isaiah declares that it will be dispensed to all without their having to pay for it without money and without price. He urges them, moreover, to stop wasting their money in purchasing that which is not bread. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. That which is not inspired of God. So we hear, see here clearly today when we go to the Adventist bookstore, there's, there's many books that are totally uninspired that are not bread. And we're told to leave those alone and to buy that which is bread. And it comes without 
uh, the recipients having to pay for it. Of course, the question is, well, how does it get paid for? And that's where tithe and offerings come in, as we'll discuss later. So the rise of this message began in California. And as Brother Howdoff shared it in the Sabbath school, there were a much interest awakened. And even though he was pushed out and the Sabbath school had to move over across the street into the house of a lady, uh, uh, turns out it was the uh, grandmother of Florence Howdoff, Sister Charbonneau, who had a house across the street where they met and great interest was awakened. And several people came in and accepted the message. And they gathered here and had their first session in the May of 1934. And this was the first session of Davidian Seventy Avenues, and it was held in Los Angeles, California. And there's some important figures here. On the top row, off to the center on the right, is Brother Howdoff. To our left of him, the next gentleman is Elder E.T. Wilson. We'll learn more about him. He was... Um, one of the conference men that accepted the message. Next to him is Brother Harry Warden, the first minister of the message, and we'll learn more about him. Next to him, Brother Dieter. Um, and then next to him, the tall gentleman, that's uh, Martin James Bingham. And we're going to see that each one of these people had a role to play in future uh, uh, history of this message. And then down on the front, we have... This lady here, Vida Warden, the wife of Harry Warden, we're going to see they had a very important role of keeping the message alive during the 1960s and 70s. Next to her is the young a woman, Florence Hermison, who later became the wife of Brother Howdoff. And then over here, along the front, that young man, Oliver Hermison, we're going to see he had a role in unfolding of events later in time. So the message rose up in California, in the west coast of the United States. But it moved eastward. The pioneers moved east. And here's a famous picture. This is a picture, this group of 12 people moved from California, and it took them over three and a half days to get to Waco, Texas. And so May 24, 1935, 12 pioneers arrive at Waco, Texas to establish Mount Carmel Center. And this is recorded in Symbolic Code, Volume 1, Numbers 11 and 12. And this is excellent history. I, I recommend that you read this if you haven't to learn about God's providence in relocating the message into the middle, middle of the United States here. So, of course... Some of those pioneers, we have Brother Wilson in the middle there, Brother uh, Sister Charbonneau and her husband, Brother Knipple, Florence Hermison, Brother Dieter and his wife Naomi, and uh, Oliver Hermison, and their mother, Mrs. Hermison, and then, of course, Brother Haddaf. So what instructed them to go east from California and set up a camp? Well, it's recorded in the codes. And it, this is recorded in Volume 1, Symbolic Code, Number 10, Page 3. And this was published April 1935. And it reads, It has been evident for some time that it would, be soon, that it would soon be necessary to seek a more central location for the office in order to serve the whole field efficiently. So those at headquarters have been praying very earnestly over this matter for many months. As they kept on praying for light, the Lord finally indicated definitely that beautiful Southern California was no longer to remain the center of his work for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But an eastward course was to be seen in the stream from that fountain which is to swell into the great river of Ezekiel's prophecy. And plans were soon formulated whereby a thorough search would be made in the territory indicated by the Lord where the future headquarters were to be found. So here we see that on the basis of this prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 37, that the message moved. So that fountain had to be open at this time. In order for them, uh, this was the, the way that God definitely showed to them to move eastward. So if it was applicable then, 
Why not still applicable today? So here's, of course, that prophecy uh, in that chart in the fountain is way over here on the left side. And of course, that had to be open as a teeny rivulet. Otherwise, there would be no basis for moving eastward from California to Waco, Texas. And as we go into later presentations, we'll see the importance of this prophecy of indicating further movements of the headquarters as a result of this same prophecy. Things we cannot ignore or set aside. So how did they decide to locate in Waco? Well, it's recorded. They searched out the land. So in February 1935, brothers of E.T. Haddaf, M.L. Dieter, and E.T. Wilson met in San Antonio, Texas and spent more than two months searching for property northward as far as the Dallas Fort Worth area, and then southward even down to San Antonio. They were strongly impressed that the new home for the work should have a rural base of operations separated from worldly influence. This is crucial to understand, as we'll see later in, in history. So while they were visiting Waco, their attention was called to a 189-acre piece of property about five miles from the city center and bordering on the shores of beautiful Lake Waco. And we have a video testimony of Sister Bonnie Smith who recounts more of the details by how the Lord impressed them that this was the piece of land and gave them a clear sign that this is the property they should buy. So the property was about one half cultivated and the remainder was a rough uh, scrub oak and and timber uh, comprised of cedar, scrub oak, and elm trees. So it was pretty primitive land. It was totally undeveloped. And this, of course, is recorded in Symbolic Code, Volume 1, Number 10, Page 3. This history is recorded for us. So it's important to recognize there was a rural base of operations. And this is what the layout looked here. You can see outlined in green, that was that 189 acres. And this is a map of the city of Waco, Texas in 1936. So the red line is the city limits as it existed then. And then the green line is approximate layout of Mount Carmel. And over there to the left, it's along the shores of Lake Waco, a man-made lake. And there's a dam there. And so this was the location of... Old Mount Carmel. And this is a contemporary picture from that dam on Lake Waco looking towards what they called the hill, uh, eastward towards the hill. Now, Texas is, doesn't have very big mountains there, but that is a rised elevation, and that was the place where uh, Mount Carmel was located on the shores of this beautiful Lake Waco. To get a better picture of what Waco looks like today, there's in black there is the approximate layout of the original property. Now, uh, Lake Waco actually was uh, increased in size a little bit, but the red outline here is the current city limits of Waco, Texas. And this expansion from the original there. Uh, occurred in 1956. And we're going to see how this played out. Uh, the brother had have saw this coming in, and that was the reason this property was sold off. Let's look at it from another perspective. This is a Google map. Uh, this is what Waco looks like today. It's fully developed. Uh, there in green is the approximate layout of the uh, original property. The red was the city limits in the 1930s. But today, if you go there to Waco, you see that this whole area has, you know, got uh, shopping centers, schools, uh, country clubs, high-class neighborhood. It's thoroughly city all the way around. So it's a very different situation than it was in the 1930s and 40s. Later, the camp, uh, they bought that 189 acres, and then they expanded to 377 acres. Here's an aerial picture of the camp taken um, in 1940, showing a lake here. It's called Lake Maribouth, and we'll learn more about that. The King's Highway, 
which is back in the background there. And then way back, you see in the distance there, um, was the city of Waco. So you see, it was definitely separated. There, there was uh, rural land completely surrounded. There was no city influence, no schools, no shopping centers, no uh, uh, waste treatment plants at all. And of course, the gate here at Mount Carmel, this highway you see down below, that was the old Texas Highway 6, and one of the entrances is off of that. And this gate, uh, this entrance never had a gate. This was not a closed compound or whatever. Anybody was free to come and go. So let's break down some of the, his, uh, the key things that happened here at Mount Carmel Center, Waco, Texas. It existed for 20 years, from 1935 to 1955, until the death of Brother Haddoff, after which it was liquidated or sold off. So 1935, the headquarters moved from California to Waco, Texas. In 1937, a constitution and bylaws were written. 1943, the organization was named the General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, and this was in response to defending the non-combatant status of young Davidian men during World War II because the General Conference had refused to support them in this status. So Brother Haddoff had to organize an association to and wrote a tract called Mil Military Stand to defend their right to uh, not to have to bear arms and go to war against fellow Christians on the other side. Um, this this history is, of course, grossly uh, exploited and, and malaligned by the conference, seeing that the shepherd's rod broke and separated from the church, but this is utterly false. They did this out of necessity because of the neglect of the general conference to support Davidian young men. Also that year, the first certificates of fellowship were issued, 1946, the Timely Greetings series was uh, started to be published. Uh, the symbolic code had ceased, and then in 54, it resumed its publication with the startling announcement that Mount Carmel began to be sold off. And this is Symbolic Code, Volume 10, Number 1. Very important code to read and understand. And then finally, in 1955, Victor T. Hadov passes away on February 5th. So this is the breakdown. We'll go into a little more detail here. Now, this work at Mount Carmel, it was only there for 20 years in the middle of a depression called the Great Depression. And it's really a marvel how this thing rose up and prospered as it did when the whole country was, uh, most men were out of work and, and people were poor. But it's clearly people that are, were around this and connected with it knew that God's hand was in advancing this work over this place. So there were branches of the work much in parallel with the various branches of the work we saw in the rise of the Second Advent Movement. There was a, the foundation, really, was the Universal Publishing Association. This was started by Brother Howda in Los Angeles in 1930. There was Mount Carmel Academy. That was a school educational part for the young children. There was the International Benevolent Mercantile Association. This took care of all of their uh, goods and necessities of life. They even had their own bank called the Bank of Palestina, an internal bank. There was the Davidical Levitical Institute, a school of prophets or ministerial training program. There were agricultural enterprises at Mount Carmel Sailway where they sold uh, out to the public. They had a bakery, a cafeteria. There was Mount Carmel Dispensary and a rest home, a place to take care of the sick and the infirmed, and especially the older Davidians. There were satellite ministries in Salem, South Carolina, Yoder, Wyoming. So we see here many branches of the work involved at Mount Carmel Center. So today, uh, those that claim this title have a weighty responsibility to fulfill all that was done in the example or the type, if you will, under Brother Howda. So let's look at the publishing work. That was the foundation. And we see here three different kinds of printing presses. I always like to ask people, which one do you think here was used at Old Mount Carmel? Well, down here on the right, on the bottom, we have what's called the Washington Hand Press. And that was the type of press that they 
uh, used at the beginning of the publishing work back in the 1850s, 40s, uh, J uh, James White. And then later, this press above it, it was called a, a, a steam press. It was run by steam generators, and it was an offset press. They could, uh, had a, like a type plate, and it could make multiple copies from one printing plate. So this greatly sped up the operation. This is the type of press you saw when the Review and Herald was started in the 1860s. And it was considered state of, art at, of the art at the time. The kind of press that Brother Haddiff used is here over on the left is called the AB Dick. It was an offset duplicator. It printed black on white paper. So this is the, the exact type of press that Brother Haddiff used um, starting 1946. So the publishing department uh, was had the following people. The editor was uh, Brother Haddiff. The assistant editor, this taller gentleman here on the right, was uh, M.J. Bingham. And the associate editors were Mrs. Sophia Hermeson, of course, his wife, and then Mrs. Genevieve Bingham, the, the wife of Bingham. Now, the Binghams were educated in English teachers, so they were experts in grammar and English. And as you read the rod, you'll note that it's quite perfected. It's almost essentially flawless in terms of grammar and presentation. A brother had of English was not his native tongue. So God appointed him assistants to do this work, just in the same way that Ellen White had assistants to assist her in her publishing her large volumes of work. Of course, by the end, the publishing work had got to the point, this was a new print shot that was completed in 1954 to handle the large volume of printing. By this time, they had a large mailing list, and they were at its peak, uh, the Mount Carmel was putting out about 50,000 pieces of literature every two weeks. This is a remarkable output for that day. And we're going to compare that with what's happening today. And it's, it's a sad, uh, sad analogy to look at this. But things were very, very well organized and, and efficient under the direction of Brother Haddiff. So the Universal Publishing Association established in 1930, and it began with this document. This is one of the original 33 hectograph copies of Shepherd's Rod Volume 1 that was placed in the hands of the leadership. And this, there is an actual copy preserved of this in the General Conference archives, and so we were able to get photographs of it. Later, it was converted into a a book and sold. This is the soft cover version. It was sold in 1940 for about 75 cents. And then later it was revised in 1945 as a pocket edition, uh, as a track that would uh, fit in the pocket. So this is the how this book progressed. This is the first book of Universal Publishing Association. Of course, it had the component of the track literature and we know there's 15 tracks, and we'll look at, here. here's track number one. These are actual photographs of the originals. Track number two, track number three, track four, latest news from her mother, track number five on the trumpets, track number six, track number 12, and track number 13. Now you notice some of these tracks were colored, had color in their covers. And this turns out that prior to 1946, in 1946, Brother Haddock got that offset duplicator and they began to publish all of their own literature exclusively at Mount Carmel. God's people did it. But prior to that, until they got up to that point, some of the literature was published outside printers in Waco. And that's where the colored literature or the colored covers come from. That track 12 is the first edition. And then later when it was revised and printed later editions after 1946, it was all black and white. The symbolic codes were an important part of the message. Volumes number 1 through 10. So the first volume came out in 1934, it was literally uh, uh, like a newsletter. 
on uh, letter size paper, and then it went to a legal size paper from volume one, number one, up to volume two, number two. And then starting with volume two, number three and four, 1936, it went to a professional magazine style layout, uh, very high quality, uh, semi gloss cover. And this continued up to 1942. And then there were some uh, volume seven, eight, and nine had their own unique covers. So volumes one to nine were published from 1934 to 1943. And then they went on a, uh, they stopped because the effort was diverted to uh, the publishing of the Timely Greetings, which series, volumes one and two. And then the codes resurfaced, uh, resumed in 1954 to publish only two issues, volume 10, numbers one and two in a track size format. And they brought forth some very important announcements. The codes published after the death of Brother Howdoff in 19, February 55 are not authorized by the, by the prophet himself. There's no record that he authorized those things to be published. This is volumes numbers 11 through 14. And there's a lot of controversy over whether these are part of the message or not. Um, and that's a whole other study that we've had presentations on that. But we can clearly say that they are unauthorized editions and should not be considered part of the original Rod message published by Brother Haddaf. And the reasons why, you can learn more about that. The other component were the leaves, if you will, the Timely Greetings Volumes 1 and 2. And this is what they look like when they first came out. This is a Volume 1. They were mailed out. You can see the postage stamp there. Here's an example of what uh, Volume 2 is. Please notice this artwork. It's all been changed, as we're going to see in another presentation. But this is what went out literally like the Leafs of Autumn, millions of them. And, of course, there are copies of this preserved in places like the James White Library, the Heritage Room, and all the conference men received these things. And some of them are preserved. So they were originally published on a weekly format from 1946 to 1949. Nine. They went out, like I say, a sermon would be given, and within a week, Brother Haddoff was able to make a draft copy. His wife was an expert. Florence was an expert stenographer. She took down his message, his sermon, in shorthand, and then converted it into a text. It was proofread, corrected, and then turned into a publication here within the order of a week or two. So Brother Haddoff had an extremely efficient operation to convert a, a, a sermon into a printed track within a week or two. So there's no excuse that uh, he had sermons there that uh, nobody had time to publish. If he wanted them published, they could have been published. And then later, these uh, TGs were partially revised, most of Volume 1 and part of Volume 2, up to uh, Volume 2, number uh, 15. And they were reprinted from 1953 to 54, and you will see... Uh, 53 reprint, 54 reprint. And one thing about those, they were all black and white at that time. They didn't have uh, the colored leaf covers, although the leaf was still there. Now let's look at the educational programs, not only for the young people, but also ministerial training program. And all of them, as you read like Mount Carmel Training Center, that track uh, explains the particulars. The foundation, of course, was the Holy Bible backed up and supported by the Spirit of Prophecy. Here's Arthur White, Ellen White's grandson, standing by the many volumes of his grandmother, Ellen White, her writings, and, of course, the Shepherd's Rod. This was the threefold foundation of the education um, programs. These three sources of inspired material. So Mount Carmel Academy for the Children was established in 1936. And here's a picture of the children. Of course, their work involved uh, working in the garden, manual labor. So here they are with their tools, ready to go out and work. And here's a picture of young ladies that were well-trained in basic skills of uh, canning, cooking, uh, cleaning, dressmaking, and so forth, the practical life skills. Here's the school that was built for them. Here's a couple different views of it. And it was connected to a larger building, as we'll see, that in, also involved the bakery and a cannery and a cafeteria and so forth. So that there, the school was on one end of this building. 
So we see that manual labor was an integral part of the curriculum, much like the pattern in the Madison School. If you remember from part the presentation, uh, section two, Ellen White started the Madison School in out of Nashville, Tennessee in 1904, and that was the model that God designed. And so Brother Howdoff followed that. Here's a picture of uh, Brother Howdoff with the workers. And one thing is everybody there learned to work hard, even the children. So manual labor was an integral part of the curriculum to learn the practical necessities of life. And Mount Carmel was constant beehive of activity. Everyone was paid a wage, even the children. So they were taught not only to work hard, but with their wages, they were taught the principles of proper tithing. Even though they were given a small wage, they were taught how important to return a portion to God. So they were very well instructed. Brother Haddaf was paid equal to his secretaries and less than some of the skilled laborers. People charge that Brother Haddaf was trying to enrich himself, but this is completely contrary. He, he accepted less pay than the carpenters and the, the skilled laborers there that were working under him. So this shows you what kind of character he had. The Davidic Levitical Institute was established in 1943. This was a ministerial training program, and here's the first class that graduated. Uh, Brother E.T. Wilson there, the gentleman, the second from the left there, he was one of the teachers along with Brother Howdoff, and this was the class. There were some Glenn Green and um, his brother, uh, Merritt Wolf, Oliver Hermison, uh, Brother Vinoy, there were several people here that later had roles to play in history. Here's a picture Brother Brother If This is actually famous. This has been in a lot of books in the world. This is Brother Haddiff with two students, James Springer behind him and in front of him, Dudley Goff. They oftentimes in the media misidentify that man as Dale uh, Perry Jones, who was a later uh, an accomplice with Dale uh, David Koresh. But that's not... Uh, Dale Perry Jones, that's uh, Harmon Springer. So the media's got a lot of things wrong about the history of the Shepherd's Rod. They were issued certificate of fellowship cards or required to have one before they could attend this institute. And of course, the answer books explains what the criteria were to become a certified member. It was signed by Brother Haddiff. Here's an actual card that uh, belonged to Sidney Smith, the husband of Bonnie Smith. These cards were re renewed on an annual basis. And without these, one was not certified to go teach in the name of the rod. They were to listen only until they got to the point where they were certified to be teachers in the name of the rod, and they were all speaking the same thing. Next, we're going to look at Mount Carmel Rest Home and Dispensary. Brother Haddaf took very seriously the care of the sick and the affirmed in the midst of them. So this is the rest home that was built. Here's another view of it. It was a very uh, simple but robust structure based on the architecture that he, where he grew up in Romania. And here's the place where they took care of the uh, people that were sick or injured. And this verse in scriptures was very important to Brother Haddaf. Isaiah 58 verse 7 it reads, To deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. And Brother Haddaf talked about this in detail in Symbolic Code, Volume 1, Number 13, uh, uh, article entitled, Our Long Neglected Work, because the denomination had turned its back on its faithful supporters and were sending the old people out into the poor houses of the world. And furthermore, those Seventh-day Adventists that studied the rod and accepted it, were cast out of the churches and disfellowshipped and, and nobody to take care of them. So those that took a stand for the rod and supported the message, Brother Haddaf took it as a very serious obligation to take care of their needs, especially as they got older. Unfortunately, this aspect has been uh, sadly neglected. Uh, after his death, the associations have oftentimes turned their back on their older older supporters and show great negligence in this aspect of the work of Old Mount Carmel Center. The Bank of Palestina was organized in 1938, and here's a picture of the script that was printed 
uh, there were copies of this still of um, they showed up sometimes on eBay in recent years. Um, there's also copies at Baylor University in the Carroll Library of Texas History. And it's also recognized in numismatic journals as a rare form of script. Mount Carmel residents were paid using this script by the Bank of Palestina, and it was for transactions within the camp only for buying and selling. And all basic supplies were provided by the International Mercantile Association. The script could be exchanged for U.S. dollars for special purposes outside the camp if they needed something that the Mercantile Association didn't provide. Now, Brother Hadoff himself did write thousands of checks, and here's some samples of them, to businesses out in the world to buy supplies and bring things into the camp. Next, we're going to look at the agricultural work, the branch of the work. And of course, as we see here, it had much to do with peaches. That was an important part of the work, a peach orchard. Now, here is some men building a barn out of stone, a very robust structure. And here's the finished structure. It was a very sturdy and robust structure. And in, in, in this, they used it for a dairy barn for uh, a dairy herd. Here's a picture down here. The dairy uh, barn was on the left and the pump house there on the right and up above it on the hill where the residences, where the people lived. Here's another view showing that barn and the pump house, but cropland where they grew their own food. So Mount Carmel grew most of its own food, including a dairy herd to feed barn, as we see here, and a large commercial sized peach orchard of which they sold the excess. So Mount Carmel was actually quite famous around the area for its peaches. And they had this Mount Carmel Sailway, which was out on the highway um, six at the gate of the camp. And these peaches were very famous. People came from over 100 miles to buy them because they were very sweet and delicious. And this is a view of the King's Highway headed from the B8 building towards Waco. And along one side of this is where these peach orchards were kept. Of course, to meet the needs of the people when they started there, they needed a kitchen and they had a the original one was this basically a tar paper shack. And in there, there was some very important baking equipment that some con believers from Wisconsin had sold their bakery and brought the equipment down. And this was used to make bread and, and cook for the people. Well, one day this building caught on fire and the people quickly assembled and tried to get a bucket brigade to put the flames out. But it was soon very apparent that... Uh, that this wasn't going to work. So there's a great miracle uh, story with this unquenchable kitchen fire. So this place was about to burst into complete flames. And Brother came, brother Hadoff came out and said, well, there's nothing more than we can do. We will have to kneel down and ask God to save our kitchen. So they all knelt down and Brother Hadoff prayed. And when they got up off their knees and looked up, the fire was out. There was just a little bit of smoke. And so the people knew that this was a true man of God, a true prophet of God. When he prayed, God heard his prayers. And so he saved, the kitchen was saved. God intervened when all human effort was spent. So this is one of many miracles that occurred there. And then later, a new kitchen and dining hall were built. And here's a picture of that, a very nice building. They had inside a little orchestra pit where they played sacred music and the people enjoyed fellowship in this building. And this was one view of it here. It was called the domestic science building. It was a large part of the activities of Mount Carmel took place here. It included a bakery, a cannery, and a cafeteria. And here's a view from the other side. On one end there on the left of this view is where the children's school was, the academy. Now Mount Carmel had a very vigorous building program, continuous over that 20 years from 1935 to 1955. And one thing to note is that all the building was done by members, by believers. They did not hire worldly contractors or people to come in and build up God's work. The, God's people were the ones that built the wall, just like in Nehemiah's time, that they, only Israelites were involved in building up the temple. 
the city of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. So we see the same thing reproduced here. Here's an overview, an aerial picture of Mount Carmel taken in 1940, and we'll highlight some of the parts. Here's the entrance gate, and this was down here on this road that leads up from Highway 6 up a hill. Uh, the residents, they called it the hill, that was the high spot. They were in this area here, the, the various residential buildings. The domestic science building, um, as we saw, was located here. Now, th this wasn't built until two years later, 1942, so it doesn't show up in this picture. And then the administration building, B8, that was uh, shown right here. And then the peach orchards were along this King's Highway, um, along here, where they grew all the peaches. And then, of course, the dairy barn and the pump house, the agricultural work, was down below this dam in this area. And it doesn't show up here as well, because these structures were built after this picture was taken. Well, the center stone or centerpiece of Mount Carmel was B8, the administration building. And this is how it looked in 1938 when it was completed. Very robust structure. Here's a later view in the 1940s with the completed landscaping. Here's a view in the wintertime. And another view with rare snow, of course, which the children enjoyed it very much. Brother Haddiff lived on the top floor. You can see the dormers there. And um, all the publishing work and the office work was done on the first level. B8 has in its interior this infamous 11th hour clock. It was the centerpiece in Boston, the central foyer, is a highlight of this unique building. And this building actually is one of the only left standing besides the print house. And it's in the hands of a private prep school, Vanguard Prep School. And it's been recently restored, and this clock image has been restored, and it's now it's a library. It's a historical building in the state of Texas. And here's a view of the office showing um, the many things here. It was a very busy place. Uh, they handled all the correspondence, mailing, and literature production. At its peak, Mount Carmel Center had over 50,000 names on their mailing list and sent out upwards of 50,000 pieces of literature every two weeks. So a very organized and disciplined operation under Brother Haddiff's direction. There was no slack going on here. Here's some of the other buildings. This was B2. The, they named the buildings as they were built. So this was a primarily residential structure, the Charbonneau's. Sister Charbonneau was the first convert to the message, and she provided the house across the street from the Exposition Park Church in California, where Brother Haddiff uh, held his Sabbath school after they were kicked out of the church. So they were they sold that property and, and used it to help finance uh, building at Mount Carmel, and they lived on the top floor, and the bottom floor here was the infirmary to take care of uh, people that had been injured or were ill. This building here, uh, B4 was a dormitory where they housed uh, uh, the men and women separately that were a part of the work. Uh, this is Bill, uh, B6. This is actually residences for some of the families there. And they were very uh, well-built, solid structures, simple and plain. Here's a view of the chapel, Mount Carmel Chapel. And you see the charts in the background. This is the place where Brother Haddiff gave the sermon addresses from 1946 to 49 that became the Timely Greetings series. Water was important there in Texas and it was stored. They built a storage tower. It was up on the high place and they pumped water up to this. And then from there, it was gravity fed to all the residences and buildings on the camp. They also had a dam. Here's a road leading down to one of the dams. And here's a picture of it, dam number two, to store water. Now, they had a lake called Lake Maribath, and there was a miracle here. And when they built this lake, they, all they had was this two-cylinder tractor. And the men that did this did not have engineering degrees, and, and they didn't quite know what they were doing. doing. So it took them a couple years. They built this up with dirt, slowly but surely. And here's an aerial view of this dam. And this was taken by the city of Wago because there was a real crisis. This dam had washed out and was about to collapse, break, and all that water behind it. And below it was Texas Highway 6 and then some other properties below it. So there, there was an imminent peril here. So they sent out men to 
uh, look into this. And what happened was um, that it rained and the, and the dam gave way, except for this thin wall. So the city sent out uh, YCC engineers to look at it and see what they could do. And, and there's no way any man in his right mind would go down there into that mud below that wall, of, thin wall of dirt holding all that water behind it. So Brother Haddiff wished them the best and gave them cookies and punch, and, and they went on their way. So the men, he called all the men from the heads of the family, and they knelt down there in that mud and prayed, and Brother Haddiff prayed and asked for God to protect them. And he assured the men that God would have his hand over it, and they would go down there and be able to fix that. And so talk about a test of faith. They They had to know that he was a man of God, a prophet of God that God had called, because they went down there and uh, uh, began the repairs and, and fixed this. So this is another one of the great miracles that took place at, at Mount Carmel. And people knew that they had were following a prophet of God. Of course, Mount Carmel had leadership, whether it's a flock by the air or a shepherd leading the sheep on the ground. Here's some of the key figures, of course. First and foremost, Victor and Florence Haddiff. And there's some pictures of them. And notice how they're dressed. Very proper. Florence had a very proper woman. And people knew from outside the area that Brother Haddiff must be a preacher because his wife dressed like a preacher's wife. And notice how Brother Haddiff presents himself at all, all times. So let's look at Brother Haddiff at work. Here's a picture of him about to go to the post office. He regularly traveled to pick up mail at the McGregor, Texas Post Office. This is where the Entering Wedge Society received its mail. And here's a picture of that track. It was a track on health, an excellent track, that was used to gather names for Seventh-day Adventists. And it used a different post office because the name uh, Waco, Texas, the address had become infamous with the Shepherd's Rod at this time. And there's also a cookbook on healthy cooking and vegetarian recipes. This was also published. Here's another car that Brother had fused. He was well known and respected in the Waco business community and had an open account with most of them. Of course, during this period of the Depression, he spent a lot of money with them buying materials to build up Mount Carmel, and they were very grateful to him for keeping their businesses afloat during this time when a lot of places were, were going out of business. So although he wrote thousands of checks amounting to tens of thousands of dollars on a regular basis, he himself owned no property or vehicles. He did not even have a personal savings or checking account while administering the work at Mount Carmel Center. Brother Haddiff was personable. Although he had no children of his own, Brother Haddiff enjoyed the children at Mount Carmel. Here's a picture of him trying to get this little girl to smile or laugh. I mean, she was known to never have smiled, but he, he, he very much uh, enjoyed trying to uh, interact with the children there. Here's a picture of him at home. He was known to be approachable and friendly, but always serious and strict in his going about the Lord's business. Of course, they had a, a, a very heavy load of responsibility to bring this message to the church. And notice his deportment here. He's always wearing a tie and always looking like a minister, a true minister of God. Here's some other early Davidian ministers of note. This is Brother E.T. Wilson. He was an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and president of the Texaco Conference when he publicly accepted the Rod message in 1933. And his letter of testimony is found in track number seven, The Great Controversy Over the Shepherd's Rod. After he, of course, accepted the rod, he was immediately disfellowshipped and stripped of office. But I, God brought this man in to help Brother Haddiff organize this important work at Mount Carmel Center because he had the training as a conference man. This is Brother Harry Warden and his wife. They were the, he was the first ordained Davidian minister and traveled extensively witnessing for the message. And we're going to see how important he was in preserving the rod later in the 1960s and 70s. This is Dr. W.S. Butterbaugh. He was a medical doctor from Canyon City, Colorado, and he converted the Rod message in 1931. And his witness letter is also published in track number seven. 
So we see here that many people that came into the rod were well educated and not all just simple people that were fooled by a, a, a so-called false doctrine as the church charges. But there were many intelligent people that accepted this message, and that's true to this day. There were groups scattered about. Here's a company in Alabama. Here's a group from Canada. Most likely they were from the Edmonton, Alberta area, and there's still some around that area. Here's a larger group in Southern California. And here's a group from Meadows of Dan, Virginia. It was a whole church. Seventh-day Adventist church, the pastor accepted the message and the whole church was converted. Unfortunately, later they did renounce the message or turn from it. Perhaps one of the most notable groups was the Salem, South Carolina Davidians. There's still some of them living there today. In 1946, they built this rest home as an outreach or a branch of the work of Mount Carmel to take care of old people, especially Davidians. So this was built in 1946. Brother Haddaf visited this place and actually told the people there that someday this would be important in the future. And we'll come to see that in our next section of our presentation. Here's the church that was built there. This was the Seventh-day Adventist church. And it was one of only two on record that accepted the rod teaching. And most of its members were this family um, of Sam and Stella Smith. They had 14 children, and all of them became Davidians, the whole family. And it was because of this man, Elder Leonard Nations. He was the pastor of this church. He accepted the rod and brought it to this church, and the whole church accepted the message. And there's an interesting story that goes with this. It was when the conference found out, they, they were determined to take this church away from these people. Well, it turns out that the Smith family owned that church. So the conference came in one, one Friday, and they were coming into town to try to take this church away from these Davidians. So that night, there was an earthquake. It shook the whole area. Everybody around said, what, something's up here. And they found out about what was happening here. So the next day on Sabbath, the conference men came to try to take this church and everybody in the area, all the locals, the kin and family, came up and they told, gathered around, they told the conference men, I said, well, we don't understand everything about your religion, but we know these folks. They're good people. They're our kin. And you, they're, you're not going to take their church. And that was the end of it. Those conference men left. And this remains to this day the only Seventh-day Adventist church that accepted the Davidian message and you can go in this church, and there's still separate rod charts there, and you can still hear Shepherd's Rod message and get the literature there. So this is a uh, God has preserved this place, and of course, a church later built a another church down the road about a mile and a half, and uh, but this was the original church in Salem. Interesting story. Well, we come to the beginning of days. This is a history day that was held at Mount Carmel. Here's a photo. I believe this is 53 or 54. And this symbolic code, volume 10, number 2, page 2, explains this. It said, in all, each October, Mount Carmel pauses from its work while residents and visitors for the occasion gather in the chapel to hear and read the most significant developments in the work among Davidians, both on Carmel and afield, and to enjoy the, an accompanying program. This is History Day, or the beginning of days at Mount Carmel, as such, it is appropriately known as Day of Days. Of course, they uh, gave reports on how the work had progressed, both at Mount Carmel and out in the field. And this was commemorating the day back when Brother Haddaf had left the camp to go back to Bulgaria for a while, and Brother Wilson was left in charge, and Brother Bingham tried to take over the camp. And so there was a power struggle there, and the Brother Haddaf came back and put down the rebellion, if you will, and it was a commemoration of, of that event, and they called it the Day of Days. Well, Brother Haddaf passed away in February 55, and so while the shepherd is resting, the rod keeps on working. So February 5th, 1955, Brother Victor Tasho Haddaf, aged 69 years, passed away on Sabbath evening at the Hillcrest Hospital in Waco, Texas of heart failure. This was not a sudden death. Uh, people well knew for over two years that Brother Haddaf had uh, um, heart trouble. So this wasn't unexpected. 
Um, he probably literally worked himself to death, much like James White, and probably the stress of dealing with the administration and keeping out false prophets and teachers, of course, which he warned us about, would arise, and surely they have after he died. The funeral was attended by many businessmen and officials from the city of Waco, as well as a number of Seventh-day Adventists. As I mentioned earlier, he was very highly regarded uh, as a businessman of impeccable character, and he literally kept those Waco, many Waco businesses afloat during the Great Depression, and they were very grateful to him for this. And even Seventh-day Adventists who uh, were against him had enough respect to come and attend his funeral. There was estimated that several hundred people were in attendance. His publishing le legacy, known as the Shepherd's Rod Message, left behind over 4,700 pages of text comprised of books, tracts, letters, and sermon addresses, totaling about 130 pieces of literature. It is remarkable that a Bulgarian immigrant having only a fourth grade education could make such an impact on the Seventh-day Adventist Church that still has its leaders scratching their head. His work continues to captivate the interest of worldly scholars, artists, and writers to this day. And as the Rod message is agitated in the church, it still creates a great controversy as the scholars are confounded to attempt to refute its plain teachings. So this is the legacy of that man. So though resting a while, Zerubbabel's hands and Elijah's helpers labor on. Here's a picture of his funeral. So we greet, farewell, Brother Hadif. We hope to meet you in that blessed Beulah land where you will resume your labors once again. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up among them. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. So we see here that this antitypical David, Brother Hadif, will arise again in the special resurrection mentioned in Daniel 2 to resume his work again, once again in the kingdom of God, along with all those that died in the faith of the three angels' message. As the scripture says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Zechariah 13, verse 7. After Brother Hadoff's death, Faithful Davidians recognized the fulfillment of this verse, that although the shepherd was smitten, the sheep would be scattering. So as we move into the next section of our presentation, well, the scattering time, we will look at the history after the uh, passing of Brother Haddoff in 1955. Just to show you some of the scholarly books that have arisen that discuss Old Mount Carmel and Brother Haddoff from the period 1993 to 2006. These books, have, of course, arose after the infamous burnout of the Branch Davidian compound in Elk, Texas, under David Koresh. So this book, Madman in Waco, was published by Brad Bailey and Bob Darden in 1993. Bob Darden was interesting. He was a part of a family that was a neighbor of Mount Carmel under Brother Haddoff, and it turns out they, they didn't have a liking to Brother Haddoff. So his report uh, to the world is not terribly flattering, nor totally honest. Armageddon in Waco, Stuart Wright, University of Chicago Press. So you see academic presses getting involved here, and academics. Why Waco, James Tabor and Eugene Gallagher, University Professors of Religion and Sociology, University of California Press, 1997. The Ashes of Waco, an investigation, Dick Rivas, Syracuse University Press. Here's a copy of that, 1988. Expecting the End, Millennium and Social Historical Context, Kenneth Newport, Crawford Gibbons, editors. It was a number of articles by academics, and um, they included the Davidians. And this is Baylor University Press. And lastly, this book uh, by the Branch Davidians of Waco by Kenneth Newport, Oxford University Press. This is supposedly the, the final authority on, on the history of the Rod message. But unfortunately, all of these academic efforts do a disgrace to the message because, number one, they don't believe it. Number two, they don't paint a terribly flattering picture. They don't have all the information or the facts. So truly, what we need at this time is the history told from the, from the perspective of those who believe and practice the message. 
and can tell of these miracles because these are ignored. But for, unfortunately, the media in the world all consult these sources when they hear the name of Davidians or Branch Davidians, and they have no clue the difference between the groups. And so this is part of the reason we need to have this history preserved. And as we move into the scattering period, we'll learn more about how God preserved the truth and the various factions or offshoots from the true vine. We thank you for your attention once again. May God bless your search for truth as for hidden treasure, and we look forward to your participation in section four of this presentation. Thank you, and God bless.